So, I started The F-Bomb, a blog and community for teenage feminists as a high school student. I had just discovered feminism and I was so excited to have found a movement that perfectly described everything I believed in. The only problem was I lived in Ohio where feminism really was a dirty word. So I turned to the internet to find a community of like-minded peers. But for some reason, I guess because I was the first to reach out, I was the first to create this space where this convening could happen, I was looked to as something of a leader. And I felt incredibly ambivalent about this because on the one hand, I was honored that people looked up to me and saw something in me that they thought resembled leadership. But on the other hand, I couldn't shake this feeling that I was gonna let these tens of thousands of people down and that I was going to fail. I experienced a similar thing this past year when I published my first book, A Little Left Up, Why Feminism is Not a Dirty Word. On the one hand, I was so grateful to have had the opportunity to write a book as a teenager in high school. It was incredible. But on the other hand, I wrote a book as a teenager in high school. I had no idea what I was doing. I was terrified the entire time. And while I was knowledgeable about this subject and really passionate about it, I still couldn't shake this feeling that I was just going to let everybody down. It took me a while to realize that this was not a personal failing of self-confidence. This was really just me being a young woman in a culture that encourages young women to live up to this unattainable standard of perfectionism. Now, superficially, it might seem like perfectionism is a feminist victory. After all, wasn't the point of feminism to allow us to be the best that we could possibly be and achieve the most we possibly could? In reality, though, it's incredibly detrimental. It's not allowing us to lead the best quality lives possible. It's certainly not free from sexism. And ultimately, it's impacting who we are and how we exist in this world. Now, there are many factors that contribute to this perfectionism. But the one that I think has impacted me the most and the one which I see impacting my fellow Columbia students the most is definitely the media. The first way in which the media does this is through a really negative standard of body image. It's no secret that the media is full of unhealthy, unrealistic, demeaning images of women. We see them all the time. We are surrounded by it. In fact, our generation consumes an average of 10 hours and 45 minutes of different forms of media every single day. It surrounds us, and it's impacting all of us. And I do mean all of us, because the stereotype tends to be middle, upper class white women. But there's a lot of studies now showing that this transcends race and class. This is really all of us. And unfortunately, it's starting to transcend ages, too. For example, 42% of first to third grade girls want to be thinner. 80% of 10-year-old American girls say they have been on a diet. 53% of 13-year-old girls are unhappy with their bodies, a number that increases to 78% by age 17. We internalize these images and equate them to our self-worth. We're taught that we can only be happy if we have the perfect body, and we can only have the perfect body if we fit what is ultimately an unattainable, often anatomically correct, if you've seen some of these ads, standard. But it's not just about beauty standards or these ads. It's also about the way the media treats women when they attempt to lead, when they attempt to resist this paradox. A perfect example of this is the media's treatment of Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin during the 2008 presidential campaign. Now, political ideologies aside, it is undeniable that these women were represented, were presented as opposite ends of a sexist dichotomy based on sex appeal or their ability or inability to live up to some ridiculous standard of femininity. And they were treated in this way that men simply are not. In fact, male politicians can weather far more serious transgressions than a really bad pantsuit and emerge relatively unscathed. For example, take the former mayor of DC, Marion Barry, who was convicted of cocaine possession and then reelected a few years later. Or former governor of New York, Elliot Spitzer, who weathered a prostitution scandal and yet today enjoys a lively career as a political commentator. It's a clear double standard, and young women are not blind to this. They see this, and they internalize it. It would take an incredibly self-assured young woman to look at this double standard, to look at this treatment, and think that leading, that being in that same position was something that she could do. It would take an incredibly self-assured young woman in a culture that encourages young women to be anything but. And I think that both of these phenomena can help explain the statistics that people who often say we're post-feminist point to. Like, for example, that in 2011, young women accounted for 59% of the college-educated edu entry-level workforce. Empirically, it seems like we're progressing, like we're even leading. But when you consider statistics about leadership, 
at being at the top of your, of your fields. Women still hold only 17% of seats in the US Congress. We hold only 3.8% of Fortune 500 CEO positions. And the statistics continue. We're clearly lagging behind. And I think this is because we're taught that we have to be perfect. We can never fail. So we'd rather take what's directly in front of us, what's easily achievable, than really try for something harder. And I will totally admit that there are definitely sexist and oppressive forces that cause these statistics as well. But I don't think we can discount the role that perfectionism plays. So why do we do this? This is really so horrible for women. Why don't we just rebel against it? And I think ultimately, we're taught that the only way we can be happy is if we're perfect, that this perfectionism is the only way we can achieve true happiness. Yet happiness is really never defined. It's completely amorphous, and I don't think any of us would know when we had really achieved it, precisely because it is actually unattainable. So I painted a kind of bleak picture, but I do think that there are some solutions that I would love to see the Columbia community and women and men at large work on. And the first is that we need to completely discard this association between perfectionism and happiness, and instead focus on humanity and contentment. So if happiness is this reward of perfectionism that ultimately doesn't exist, I think we need to work on being content, on going after what we truly want as individuals free from this paradox. We also need to be completely honest with ourselves and each other. You know, Once we talk about this with each other, we can see that these images are breeding on silence, that if we uncritically consume them, they won't go away. We have to be honest about how these images make us feel and start an open and honest dialogue. And finally, we have to do something that is completely antithetical to what we're taught as Columbia students, and that is to embrace failure. Because personally, I would rather fail ethically going after something I know would make me completely content and fulfilled than to worry about being on a treadmill towards perfectionism for the rest of my life with no real reward. So those are some kind of vague solutions. And I will admit, they're much more easily said than done. But ultimately, I mean, I know this. This is something that I face on a daily, if not hourly, basis of my life. And as I said before, I struggled a lot when I wrote my first book, A Little Left Up. I thought if I was given this opportunity, if I was going to be this one random teenager writing a book, I had to write the best book ever. It took me a while to realize that you know I am a teenager. I'm not going to write the best book ever. But what I can do is write the book that I have in me with honesty and passion. And once I realized that, I enjoyed the process so much more. And I think that my work was ultimately so much stronger for it. I want to be very clear, though. I don't want to paint my generation as a generation of victims, necessarily. I have met so many incredible women and male allies through my work with the F-bomb and through being a student at Barnard in Columbia who, though I'm sure they are not immune to this perfectionism, look it in the face every day and say, I will not let you overcome me. I'm going to succeed and lead anyway. My point in bringing this up and talking about perfectionism is to identify it, is to name it as what sexism looks like in this day and age. Because as a young feminist, I'm often asked why we still need feminism today. People often say, haven't we already achieved equality? Isn't sexism a thing of the past? To which I say, yes, I've seen Mad Men. I realize that we do not face that type of blatant misogyny on a daily basis. I will give you that, which although I do think it still exists, but maybe not for all of us. In fact, sexism today is much more subtle. I think living in a culture that demeans us, that equates our self-worth with what we look like, that's sexism, especially when the same is just not true for men. So ultimately, my hope for the Columbia community, to the men in this audience, I really hope that you tell the women in your lives they do not need to be perfect to succeed or to be happy. They just need to be themselves and lead their lives with passion and honesty. And to the women, tell yourselves the same thing. And also tell the women in your lives the same thing, because it means so much coming from other women. And know that you are strong, and that together we are so much stronger than we ever could be apart. And I completely believe we can overcome this. Thank you.